go. So the record is on, the mic is good, and I'm just checking the video. That's good as well. All right. So that means you know, we can get the whole class started. And what we'll do today is to review the exams from 2024 spring, last semester. There are three questions from exam one, you know, from last semester that is applicable to us. Question number two is not applicable because it talks about the borrow look ahead subtractor that we did not talk about, okay? Because you know, that topic alone is gonna take up at least two classes and a you know, few labs. So we didn't talk about that. Um, but we did talk about the double or the floating point representation. So that is in our exam, which is which was not in the exam from spring 2024. So that's why I'm also including um, exam two from last semester. Only question number three applies to us. Okay, so question number two, one and two from the second exam of spring 2024 do not apply to us. So what I have here is already kind of compiled. So I took out the questions that do not apply. So after today, I can upload the markdown file to the announcement, and then you guys can read everything that I typed and worked on today. All right, so I'm gonna get started here, you know, because you know, it's gonna take me a little bit of time to really explain everything. Um, so we'll start with the, just the general rule of the exam. Um, basically, it is open book and open notes. Uh, but everything has to be on paper. Um, in other words, you know, no iPads, no laptop computers, no desktop computers. You can bring an electronic calculator if you think that will help. Um, but other than a calculator, it can be even a graphing calculator, okay? You can be a fancy one. But no cell phones, no tablets, and so on. If you have any questions about the open book and open notes, but on paper only policy. Okay, all right, so moving on. Um, so after the exam, do not share or talk about you know, any part of this exam with anyone. Um, you know, I mean, strictly speaking, you know, you can talk to people who took the exam with you on that day, okay, during that time. But if you are encountering someone who was not in class, you know, that you do not recognize, you know, do not talk to that person about the exam because some people, you know, might have to take the exam later than the actual schedule time. Um, the grading is based on the explanation and step, or at least some of the questions is based on how you show me that you understand the material by explanation. Not every question is like that, so I'll point out you know, what questions you know, do not require an actual explanation. Um, and then some questions you know, are multi-step. So that means you know, if you get an earlier part of the question answered incorrectly, um, the question is what if you answer the rest of the question, quote unquote, correctly based on the incorrect answer that you provided earlier. So I will treat those on a case by case basis, okay? In other words, you know, in, certain, in most cases, okay, if you get an earlier part wrong, but all the later parts are consistent with the wrong answer to the earlier part, I will still get part, I will still give partial credit. The only time I will hesitate, hesitate to do this is when I you know, observe people obviously not understanding the earlier part of the question. They gave me a obviously incorrect answer, but that makes it easier for the later part to get points. So in those cases, I may not give any points at all because you know, those people are essentially kind of working the system, and I do not, yeah. Um, sufficient explanation, you know, so if I ask for an explanation, your explanation is the connection between the concepts that we talk about in this class, which includes all the definitions, all the equations, formulae, and so on, what is in the question itself, and you basically provide the glue of how I how you applied the knowledge of this class in order to solve the problem, which is in the exam. So you have to kind of go through an explanation to do that. Um, <clears throat> so last semester, I provided enough space so that people can actually write their answer on the exam itself. It is not required, okay? So for those of you who want to go like, I want to write my answer on a graph, on graph paper, 
because everything is lined both vertically and horizontally, you can do so. If you want to frame your own pieces of paper, you know, you can definitely do that. Um, if you do that, I would advise you to write your name and your student ID on paper, on those pieces of paper before the exam. So you won't be taking up extra time in the exam just to write down your name on the extra pieces of paper. All questions carry equal weight. This is actually important because it means you can use certain strategies of answering these questions. I cannot tell you what is going to be a successful you know, strategy from your perspective, but when I was a student, when I was a college student, the way I take exams is I scan through, especially if I know ahead of time all questions have equal weight, is I would scan through the questions and I will pick out the easiest one to answer first. I would also tie myself, if, there, if there's a total of four questions, I would tie myself so that you know, after, um, I will only allocate a, cer a certain amount of time per question so that I get a chance to touch every single question. And I would also allow myself a little bit of time after I answer all four questions to go back to an earlier one where I may not like the answer that I have provided or I could not figure out the answer you know, in the first attempt, okay? But I would definitely not get stuck on one single question and spend too much time on it. So how, what kind of strategy you want to use is entirely up to you, okay? You know, I'm only telling you, you know, what, I, what kind of strategy that I used when I was in college. Um, in this particular case, I also gave you the notations just so that people you know, uh, can, you know, they don't have to write down on their notes you know, what is conjunction, what is disjunction, how they are related to the C operators and so on. So that's from the you know, previous exam. So we are now moving on to question number one. Obviously you guys can focus on the right hand side because the left hand side is marked down, but that's where I'm gonna type you know, when I try to capture the answer. So question number one is basically just asking you to explain, okay, so from one to 11, these are given to you, okay? These are actual things that we already know. T of two is the negation of X1 and Y1 or the negation of Q1 and P1. So this is the um, notation that I use you know, sometimes you know, to denote you know, negation, which is using the C++ notation. What looks like multiplication is conjunction. What looks like addition is disjunction. Is that okay so far? Okay. So, um, and you know, why T2 is expressed this way, that is part of the material that you have to study, okay? Because this has to do with how the B function is defined in base two. So we went through a whole long derivation of the B function. You know, at, at first it was for base 10 and it's for base whatever, and then we specialize it to base two. But once we specialize to base two, we realize that we can convert everything into Boolean operators. So that's kind of the short version of the long explanation, the chain of explanation of how we finally get to this point. Are we good so far? Okay, all right. So one thing I would like to kind of remind you guys is you know, your, answer, your question may not include you know, these things as given. So I would, you know, if I were you, I would also write these definitions on your own notes so that you can bring it with you and not to have to rely on me giving you, you know, the uh, expressions. All right, so one, two, six are just, you know, basically they're all results of you know, how T of I plus one is defined, how D of I is defined, how Q of I is defined, okay? So nothing here is new. From seven to 11, these are specific to this question. In other words, we know the, uh, the state or the values of certain bits already, but we don't know the rest, okay? So the question is, how can I make use of only these to figure out the rest? Is that okay? So in other words, you know, this question is more or less like a puzzle, okay? We're trying to solve a puzzle. The certain pieces of the puzzle are already given as clues, and our job or your job is to figure out the rest. Think of this as a very interesting version of Sudoku. Okay, or uh, what is that one? You know, where you have to click on things to find out you know, which part is mind. Minesweeper. Minesweeper. Okay, 
So it's kind of like that, okay? You, know, you basically have to apply logic to solve you know, these particular things. All right, so we'll start with, with number 12, okay? So for number 12, um, the negation of x1 and y1, or the negation of q1 and p1 is a zero. How do we know that? Okay, so if you look at all the things from one to 11, which ones, okay? It can be a single one, it can be multiple ones, okay? So which one or which ones is are responsible so that we can come to the conclusion of point 12? One and seven, that would be correct, okay? So one and seven are the ones that we need to come to this conclusion because seven states that T2 is a zero, why? No particular reason, it is just given to us. But once we know T of two is a zero, and we also know that T of two is this particular equation, then we can just go like, oh, okay, we can just put a zero in place of the T2, and then we have number 12, okay? So let me go ahead. So this is gonna be a little challenging because you know, I have to write on this side and then you will be, you'll be writing on the right-hand side. So I'm just gonna say one and seven, okay? And if you want me, I can even bold face it, okay? So that way, oh, okay, I put this, excuse me, if I just, so I can bold face one and seven. There we go, all right. So now we are moving on to number 13. So number 13 says, you know, well, we kind of know that somehow we know that the negation of x1 and y1 is also a zero. How can we know that? So, so when we get to 13, it means we can use anything from 1 all the way up to 12, okay? And because I have to scroll a lot, okay, it helps if you have your own computer also, you know, on the same page. You know, with the PDF that I sent you earlier. So this way you can focus on all the points, okay? Because you know, it's easier for you to fit everything on your screen. It is much harder because you know, the projector does not have the same resolution. So just a, just a suggestion, okay? You don't have to do that. All right, so how do we get to the conclusion on number 13? So I've... Uh, I'll give you a, a clue here. It has to do with a truth table of a particular logical operator that you should really know about by this time. It is because of the one right before, okay? So in this case, it is because of number 12. Why? Because if you look at number 13, this is a component of the OR of the one before. So if we know the result of the OR is a zero, what do we know? Each part of the OR also has to be a zero. Does that make sense, all right? So number 13 is only because of 12, okay? Because once we know the result of the OR is a zero, then each side of the OR also has to be a zero. So that means number 14 has the same answer. It is also just because of number 12, because that is the right-hand side of the OR on line 12. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So now we move on to number 15. So let me scroll down a little bit here. So this is where, you know, it is handy for you to have your own screen to look at, you know, because I'm gonna have to scroll back and forth a little bit. Because trust me, I don't remember the answer. I have to work this out you know, as we speak, as I speak. All right, so Q0 exclusive or with T0 is a zero because of what? Well, we'll take everything into consideration, okay? So does anywhere, you know, do we know what is Q0 exclusive or with T0? It is D0, right? So we know eight, oh, I take it back, sorry. So number nine has something to do with it, and then number five also has something to do with it. 
So when you look at five, you know, it gives us the general equation of how we can compute the D zero. And then when we look at number nine, it says, oh, okay, we also know that D zero is a zero. So we basically say, oh, it's the same thing as putting this zero into here. So that would be five and nine to explain that. Okay, so we'll put that down as an answer because of five and nine, like that. So are we good so far with the explanation? All right. So the rest is kind of like that too, okay? So how do we know, okay, so when you look at things, you know, there are certain ones that are already boxed. The ones that are boxed, they're highlighted by a box because they can serve as really, really useful clues for all the later ones. In other words, by the time we get to 16, we have made a conclusion that we have resolved the value of x1 being a one, okay? In other words, this is not given. Okay, this is where the AI made a mistake. Okay, I'm not sure how many of you read the AI answer to this whole thing. Maybe I did not even you know, give you guys that because it's wrong. The AI thought the number 16 is a given, but it's not. We can actually figure this out. So the question is, how do we know this? Okay, and for some of these points, there may be alternative answers. Okay, but for this one, I'm not sure, but I know at least one way to find out and logically deduce that x1 has to be a 1 by the time we get to number 16. So the rule is you cannot use things that are after. You can only use things that are before this particular one. In other words, we can use number 1 all the way up to 15 to come to, you know, to argue why x1 is a 1. Okay, so how do you think about this? Okay, you know this has to do with a conclusion of x1, right? So you want to kind of focus on what do we know about things that include that include x1 in? Does that make sense? Okay, so we scan. Okay, we go like uh, this doesn't mention any, anything about x1. I think we can ignore that at least for now, right? This also does not have anything. Uh, this one has something. Okay, so 13 may be useful. Okay. But 13 is derived from 12, so 13 by itself is probably more useful than 12, but we can kind of keep in mind on 12 as well. Uh, this has nothing to do with x1. This has nothing to do with um, x1, but this one does have something to do with 13. So when you look at number 11 and number 13, then you can make a conclusion. Okay. So I'm going to write it down first, and then I'll go through the verbal explanation. So with this one, I don't need you guys to give me the full explanation as long as you give me you know, which points will give you all the clues to come to a conclusion. That's good enough. Okay. So what did I say again? Number 11 and 13. All right. So now let's go back and ask, why can we make that conclusion? Because 11 says y1 is a 1. Why? Because it's given, okay? You know, so there's no particular reason why that is the case. 13, on the other hand, says the negation of x1 and y1 is a 0. But wait, y1 is a 1 already. So we know one side of the conjunction is already a 1. That means the other side must be a 0 in order for the conjunction to be a 1. Does that make sense? So the other side is x1, or the negation of x1. So if the negation of x1 has to be a 0, then x1 has to be a 1. Yes? Is that a specific point? What's your answer to that question? By giving you those two other clues? So that is the thought process to come to the conclusion that number 11 and 13 together will give us the answer. But you don't need to write down the entire chain of reasoning. You just have to tell me which two lines or which one line sometimes will are sufficient to give us the answer of a particular line. But what I did explain verbally is the train of thought. Okay, how do we make use of the fact of number eleven and number thirteen in order to come to the conclusion that x1 has to be a 1. 
Are we good so far? So when I grade this, okay, if somebody gives me, just take a random shotgun approach and give me a bunch of numbers, those wrong ones will also be marked down. Okay, in other words, if someone is doing like, well, since we know it has to be somewhere between 1 and 13, 15, I'm just going to write down 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 15 here, that answer is going to be correct. Okay, because that answer does not tell me that person understands how to apply the logic to come to the conclusion. All right, I just want to throw that out first because I don't want people to argue after the exam. It's like, but I, you know, but 11 and 13 are a part of my answer. Yes, it is, but so are many of the ones that do not apply. Yes? Well, for instance, 15, when you're showing us that uh, 11 and 13 are showing us We do not have to explain, you know, because uh, that's what we said a little bit earlier. Okay, so the more thing, you know, is trying to take it to class on time. Okay, you just you know, I already explained that. We only I only need the two numbers of whatever you know each line is mentioning, and you don't have to go through the full explanation of what I just said. Okay, so it's all getting recorded. So that means if you missed the earlier part of the lecture, you can always you know, watch the lecture again up to that point. All right, so moving on to the next one. Here we go. So now we make another conclusion that t of zero is a one. So now the question is, what mentions t of zero? Uh, 15 seems to mention zero, t of zero, but in order to make use of number 15, we also need to know what is Q0, which we also know. So between 10 and 15, we might get to the conclusion. Okay, so this is just a suspicion right now. So I'm going to write it down first, okay, because if I don't write it down, I might forget about it. So now we go back and ask, can we come to the conclusion that T0 has to be a 1 because of number 10, which is Q0 is given to you as a 1, and number 15, which is saying the exclusive or between Q0 and T0 has to be a 1. The answer is, yep, it works. Okay. Well, I just gave you a very short answer of, yes, that should work. But then you have to kind of think about, why does it work? It has to do with the truth table of exclusive or. If the result of an exclusive or is a 0, and we know one side of the exclusive or is a one already, then the other side also has to be a one. There's no other choice in that case. So that means if you're, if what I just said is something that is kind of fresh in your mind, you go like, I have no idea what you just said, then you might want to come up with the truth tables of all the logical operators that we have used in this class. So that started off with NAND, and then we use and, A and B, we, then we have or, and then we have negation, you know, logical negation, and then we have exclusive or. So make sure that you have all of those truth tables with you when you cannot have those things memorized yet by the time we get to the exam. Chances are, by the time you create the truth tables, you would have it memorized already. The process of putting that on paper will help you remember the truth tables, okay? Don't quote me on that, okay? Because you know, that process is different for every, every person. So moving on, okay, now we're moving on to 18, which is the exclusive or between x1, y1 also has to be a zero. So once again, we have to go back and find things that somehow mention x1 and y1. Um, so there are a few ways to look at this, okay? So we have number 16. Okay, so number 16 seems to be useful because that actually tells us exactly what X1 is. So 16 seems to be useful. And then the other one is number 11. Okay, so if we know exactly what is um, X1 and we know exactly what is Y1, it's pretty easy to make a conclusion of what the exclusive or is between those two. Is that okay? All right. Now, the, what I'm going through right now is probably easier for those people who have at least tried to answer these questions because I have given you guys this particular exam for how many days? 
about what five days at least, you know, if not a whole week. So you know, given that time, okay, you know, having if you have tried to answer these questions, even though you could not figure out you know, how to get a few of these done, you know, it really helped you know, if once you have gone through the process. Now that I explained the answer. All right, moving on to the next one. So the next one is a conclusion that Q1 has to be a zero. So we have to look for things that somehow mentions Q1. So we just, hmm? number 18. Number 18, well, by itself is not sufficient, even though it is one of the components. Okay, so that's very good. So we need number 18. But by itself, this will get positive value. Because 18 says x1 exclusive or if y1 equal to 0. That has nothing to do with q1. So you have to link q1 exclusive or, or exclusive or if y1 to q1, which is up there somewhere. Uh, that's why I have to scroll. <laughs> I mentioned this earlier. Okay, so you're correct. Number four. So you have to mention 18 and 4 in order to get full credit for this one. Yep. I see. So you're just going with the question and following all of them on the, in, on the left side to get the answer. And that would be like, what do you want to put on this again? Because 18 is there. Because, yes. So what you see on the right-hand side is, I, I need you guys to focus on the right-hand side. Okay, I'm typing on the left-hand side because it's a markdown kind of you know, rotation. This also gives me the ability to copy and paste everything on the left-hand side at the end of the class so that you guys will all have exactly what, I'm, what we are seeing here. All right, so moving on. How do we know that x0 exclusive or with y0 is a one? So now we have to go back and see what we have mentioned about x0 and y0. Six and ten. Okay, you guys are faster than me because I have to search through this. Okay, so number six is uh, relating Q0 to x0 and y0. And then what is the other one? Ten. Okay, so now that we have, so you guys are correct. Six and ten together would basically make a conclusion that x0 exclusive or y, with y0 has to be a 1. Very good. So we go back here, and then we answer that. So 6 and 10 in this case. And then the next one is asking about um, the negation of x0 and y0 or x0 and the negation of y0 equals to 1. All right, so what does this look like? Bar. Hmm? Bar. The bar? The bar? The borrow? The borrow? Nope, it is not the borrow, okay? If it was the borrow, then we would have the negation of Q0 and Q1. So it's not the borrow. This is how, one. this is, uh, sorry, go ahead. It's the same as one. It is the same as, it's basically the exclusive or, okay? How we define exclusive or? So that means, you know, to answer this question, it is only because of 20. So 20 is the only one that needs to be mentioned here. Because that's the other way to express, express exclusive or. All right? <laughs> you are correct, but that's exactly what I wrote. Yep. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. All right. All right. So some of these equations are not given here. Okay. Some of these are in the notes. Okay. So the assumption is I assume everybody has read the actual written notes for this class as well as attended the lecture and took him, taken notes here during the lecture. Now, for those people who have not taken enough notes, it's okay, you can still watch the recording of the lecture. 
and I think I botched a few of those, you know, not capturing the screen, but I think the audio is present for all. All right, moving on to the next one, which is this one here. How do we conclude that T1 is a zero? So we want to say, okay, T1 depends on what? So we go back up here. T1 depends on X0, Y0, Q0, T0. And what have we figured out so far? We know D0 is a zero. We know Q0 is a one. We know T0 is a one. All right, so I'm going to, this is harder for me because I can't really easily see it. All right, so T1 is over here. So can we confirm that the negation of X0 and Y0 is going to be a zero? So we look at you know, the, the values of X0, Y0. So that's, that may not work, but there are other ways to figure out T of 1. So let's look at other things that mentions T of 1. Ah, this one here. So this one says you know, D of 1 is Q1 exclusive or exclusive or with T of 1. So now the question is, can, do we know D of 1 and Q of 1 at this time? We know Q of 1 and we... Hmm? D1 is on 26. Okay, we know there's 26 there. So we know these two, so that means that we can use these two to figure out what is T of 1. So that means you know, between 19, 26, and one more, right? You know, so we also need... Can't be more than 30. Huh? Can't be more than 30. 20? 26? I cannot use it yet. Hmm? 14, 14 and 19 together. Yep, that's enough. Uh, let's see. Yeah, between 14 and 19 are enough already. So there are multiple solutions to, to this one. So I will just mention the, the easiest one, which is 14 and 19. Let me go back and explain it. 14 says the negation of Q1 and T1 is a zero. Okay, so by itself, it doesn't seem to be very useful. But when you look at 19, it confirms that Q of 1 is false. If Q of 1 is false, then the negation of Q of 1 is true. When one side of conjunction is true, the only way for the result to be false is the other side has to be false. So that's why the between 14 and 19, I can already come to the conclusion that T of 1 has to be a 0. Is that okay? Now, the beauty of this particular type of question is if people cannot figure out one of these lines, it's not the end of the world, okay? Because each line is stand alone. So if people go like, okay, I really cannot figure out this line, or I got it wrong, it's okay. You just got deduction from that one single line. You can still part get full credit for all of the other lines. Is that okay? All right. So moving on to the next one. Okay, this one is pretty obvious. This one has to do with how T of 1 is defined and also how T of 1, you know, how the value of T of 1 is known. Yep. Huh? Like 22? Okay, so 13 is this, and nope, we cannot. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so can you num name, name the line? Uh, I said number two. Number two? But number two is, okay, but we don't know about Q0, T0. Uh, did you say like uh, 14 and 19 or something? Okay, so let me write it down first, okay, so that I can, so the alternative is number two and what? Uh, 13. And 13? All right, so let's take a look at whether that will work or not. Okay, so 13 says, you know, um, one side of the, of number two is false because number two and 13, no, that's not gonna work because 13 is using x1, y1 and number two is using x0, y0. So the indexes are incorrect. Mm -hmm. I mean, the approach may work, may still work, but you know, we, are, we may be quoting the wrong equation. So I'm gonna take this out for now, okay. All right, so we're moving on to this one. So this one has to do with how T1 is defined and how we know the value of T1. So it seems like we can you know, basically reuse you know, 22 right away. And then we have to look at how T of one is defined and that is given up here, it is number two. So here we have number 22 and two together. Are we good so far? All right, so it is a matter of how things are defined you know, with all the given you know, equations and also you know, what is already figured out at this point. Okay, so between those, you know, we can come to these conclusions. So moving on to number 24, so from your perspective, it is this one. Now this one is easy, it's just the one line before. That's because if you already know that this disjunction is false, that means each side of the disjunction has to be false. This turns out to be just the left-hand side, so that's how you can make a conclusion that because of 23, this has to be false. All right, moving on to 25. So 25 is the exclusive or between Q1, T1 has to be a zero. So now one thing that really helps in addition to reading the table is just looking at this and go like, oh, okay, so somehow we know D1 is a zero but that's you know, what, it, what is given here, so we cannot rely on D1. So the alternative is to know, is to say we know exactly what is Q1 and we know exactly what is T1, okay? So we'll start with T1 because we just came to the conclusion of that one. So T of one is a zero from line 22. And now the question is, do we know what is Q1? Yes, we know because it's of 19. There we go. Is that okay? On line 22, we know what is T1, which is referenced in the explicit board. And then on 19, we also know what is Q1, which is also referenced in the explicit board. When you know the values of both sides of the operator, clearly you will know the result of the operator. So now we can come to line 26. So line 26 has to do with the line right before, which is line 25 but that's also one more line that we have to quote because um, we have to relate Q1 exclusive or with T1 to D1, and that's one of the early ones, which is number three in this case. So we put now number three. All right, moving on to the next one. Um, X0 and the, uh, the negation of Y0 is a one. means we have to look for one something that mentions either the values of x0, y0 individually, but we know that cannot be the case because they're in the future. So that means we cannot rely on knowing the exact value of the individual bit. So now we look for the expression. That expression is mentioned on line 21. So we know 21 somehow is useful here. So we say line 21, so now we ask, is line 21 by itself sufficient? The answer is no, it is not sufficient. 
because knowing the exclusive, knowing the or is the one does not tell us anything about the individual item. Either side can be, I mean, okay, let me take it back. The only thing we know from line 21 is at least one side of the disjunction is a one. But we cannot, so there are three possible cases. Both are ones, the left hand side is a one, but the right hand side is a zero, or the other way around. Okay, so there are three possible scenarios. So that means we need something else to lock down and say that, oh, we know the left hand side of the or, which is here, is a zero. Okay, so is there anything that can tell us that? 24, that's right. So now we can lock down, because of both 21 and 24, we can lock down that x and zero and the negation of y zero has to be a one. So now, the ease, this is just coasting here, because the next one is because of line 27, the next one is also because of line 27. Okay, and I'll explain that. Because if you know the conjunction is a one, that means your, whatever is to the left and whatever is to the right of the conjunction, both of those have to be ones. And that's how we can make the conclusion that x is zero has to be a one, and y is, the negation of y zero has to be a one. But the negate, but y zero itself has to be a false. You have to know the negation of y zero. So that's why, so, but in here, the only thing that you can write down All right, so are we doing okay with this? Are we getting the general idea of how to do this one? All right, so being familiar with how the terms are defined in, in your head without having to reference all of these things is going to be helpful, okay? So, the, so if, you, if the question is can I resolve all of this without knowing anything about the binary subtraction, the answer is actually, surprisingly, yes, okay? If I give this question to someone who is already familiar with Boolean algebra, okay, just Boolean operator, not even the algebra, okay? Just knowing what is and or not, okay? That person can solve all of these already. But it will take that person a significant amount of time. On the other hand, for someone who already understands binary subtraction and understand, oh, I can recognize this is T of something, or this is D of something, and so on, the process is, wrong. It's a lot faster, okay? So that's number question number one. I skipped question number two because it asks some, about something that is not introduced in this class, so we skip to question number three of exam one. All right, the first question for 5%. The two's complement of a bit pattern C2 does the same as arithmetic negation. This means your C2 of U being a bit pattern is the um, negation, arithmetic negation of U. Assuming U is a binary number representing the value V. Okay, so let me take it back. So it is, what is U and what is V? V is the value, U is the bit pattern. The question asks, um, how is C2 defined? So this one does not require any application of knowledge. It is just asking you about the knowledge itself. How is C2 defined? Okay, there, so, um, okay, let me go back to that point. All right, so the answer to this question is C2, okay, I'll, I'll put it over here. So C2, C2 of a bit pattern U is the C1 of the same bit pattern plus one, which is also the arithmetic negation or the bitwise not plus one. So I cannot remember how to do that. I think it's sim U plus one. Is that okay? All right. So I'm embedding the question here because if I start a new line, it's going to break the, uh, the, the question number. <clears throat> All right. I can actually do a little better. Okay, let me let me let me do this instead. Box. Because this way, I think it will put a box around the answer, makes it stand out a little more, easier for you guys to do. All right. Cool. 
So this one has nothing to do with actually solving a problem. It is just asking, do you know what these clues come from? All right, so the next one, question number two. In a signed integer representation, the most significant bit is known as the sign bit. What is the value of this bit for all signed representation of non-negative values? What do you think? Zero. It's a zero, very good. Okay, so we'll just write that down as an answer here. Um, it did not ask you for an explanation, so you just have to mention it's a zero. All right, so the next part has three subparts here. <laughs> Since x equals to negative 7 is negative, first find the binary representation of the absolute value of x, and then find determine the minimum number of bits that are needed, and finally compute the signed binary representation of x uh, negative 7. Okay, so there are three subparts to this one. So we'll work on this here one part at a time. Find the binary representation of the absolute value of x, which is just 7. So the way we can do this, okay, box, is we can explain 7 as 1 plus 2 plus 4, which is uh, 1 in base 2. Okay, I can use this, this option here, which is better. 1, 0 plus base 2, oops, base 2, plus 1, 0, 0 in base 2, which is 1, 1, 1 in base 2. Is that okay? Because this, the first part does not say anything about the signed representation of seven, it just asks if I need a binary, binary representation of seven, what is it going to look like? Okay, it's going to look like this. So for answers like this, you have to show me the steps. Okay, in other words, if somebody is to say seven equals to one 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 in base two, that would get partial credit. It's not going to get full credit because that person did not show me the steps in between. All right, so the step in between is important. All right, next one is determine the minimum number of bits that are needed. Now, this one is a little tricky, okay? Because you know, this means we have to, okay, let's put the question back here. Box 10. All right, so how do we answer this question? How many bits do we need? The answer is actually not three. Because in a signed representation with only three bits, you will you can only represent down to negative four, but not uh, negative four to three, but not seven. So there are two ways to look at this. You can basically have argue that okay, in in signed representation so you can specify the range okay the value range you know that can be represented um, the range goes from to blah blah <clears throat> the range of a a and bit integer all right so what is what is the range if I have n bits? No, n. So n is an unknown. So if I just tell you that it is n, it goes from negative 2 to the power of n minus 1 to um, 2 to the power of n minus 1, the whole thing minus 1. All right. So let's take a quick look here. You guys basically remember we mentioned the range of a signed representation. Okay, I see I see a lot of nods. Okay, that's good. If you're not one of those people who are nodding, then you might need to review the material that we have been we have already introduced in this class because it is one in one of the modules. So now we can go back here and we can mention that um, when n equals to four, it will meet the requirement. Okay, so when n equals to 4, then we can see how negative 7, um, okay, 
when n is 4, then, you know, the range includes, okay, so I'm just going to say when n equals 4, then negative 7 and 7 are in range. Okay. That's basically how we figure out the number of bits that are needed. And then the next question is, finally compute the find binary representation of uh, negative 7. Okay, so that really is just an application of everything that we have already talked about. So I'm just going to use an equation here, box. And what we do is negative 7 is the 2's complement of 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1 in base 2. Because 2's complement is doing the same thing as negation. Um, so why didn't it read like that? Oh, okay. So let me fix the previous one first. Very good. The dollar sign suffix go here. We get rid of that. Okay, there we go. Looks better. All right. So now this belong. This turns out to be the bitwise knot of zero one 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 in base two plus one, and that turns out to be one zero 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 in base two plus one, which is one zero zero one in base two. Type here. There we go. Okay, still doesn't like it. Double subscript. Do I have a double subscript? Yep. That's supposed. To, this is supposed to be a plus. Okay, so there we go. So that's the answer. Because we basically looked at negative seven. The two's complement do the same thing as arithmetic negation. So when we apply two's complement, we have to look at the bit average. And there are four bits. We just apply two. Two's complement. I skip one step. Bitwise not of 0, 1, 1, 1 plus 1. The bitwise not of 0, 1, 1, 1 is 1 followed by three zeros. And we still have to give a plus 1, so the whole result becomes 1, 0, 0, 1. All right. So now for the next one, it's basically asking about the same thing, except this time we have to deal with negative 9. So now the question is negative 9, how many bits do we need to represent it? We need five bits. We need five bits to do it, okay? So I'm going to skip over a few of the answers here. Is that okay? Because otherwise we may not have enough time to cover all the questions. So, or I can just give you the really short abbreviated answer. Okay, so the binary representation of nine, okay, so this is the so remember, this one does not give me give us all the steps, just the final answer. So this one is one zero zero one in base two. That's nine. Uh, the minimum minimum number is needed is supposed to be five. So box five. The reasoning is similar to the one before. Okay, so that's why I'm skipping and not giving you all of those. And the final answer of this one. So with this one, I can go ahead and work out the entire thing. So negative 9 is the same as the 2's complement of 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 in base 2, which is the negation bitwise not of 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 in base 2, the whole thing plus 1, which is the same as 0, I got a party wrong somewhere. Oh, okay. I got it. I got it right. One zero one one zero. The whole in base two plus one, which is one zero one 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 in base two. There we go. All right. Moving on to number five. If X and Y are, used, are, are to use the same number of bits in W to represent the, what is the min, minimum number of bits, well, that would be the maximum between the two of those, and that would be what? Five. 
Okay, so you're going to need five bits because you know, one need one only needs four, the other one needs five. So that means that if we are to use the same number of bits, it will be five bits. And then the last one is is the signed binary representation of negative um, seven plus negative nine out of range of a W bit. You'll find integer. Use the previous part to help answer this question. And W, by the way, is um, the answer of number five, because number five says if x and y are to use the same number of the same number of bits, and W is defined over here. So let me just kind of go back here and make emphasize that W equals to five. So the question is, uh, what is the actual result of negative seven plus negative nine? Is negative sixteen? Is negative sixteen within the range of a five-bit number? Five-bit sign. I just gave you guys the equation earlier to figure out the range of values. So you have to apply that. All right, so basically we are saying n is five. So if n is five, then five minus one is four. Two to the power of four is 16. So negative 16 is within the range of a five bit signed number. Okay, so the answer the last part here is correct, okay? So it is true. So the first one is yes. And it is because um, negative two to the power of w minus one is less than or equal to negative 16. There we go. So that would be kind of like the most correct explanation that this is within range. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, so a lot of tedious steps, okay? But nonetheless, each one is just you know, a app an application of one of the steps or one of the things that we have already talked about. Okay. So moving on to question number four. So the question number four is to perform a subtraction in base seven, okay? And using the same format that we have been using in this class. We assume T zero is a zero, which is already reflected here. So question number one is what is the decimal representation of the value represented by the Y row, which is this one here. Explain how you figure out the decimal representation. All right, so let's answer that question first, okay? <clears throat> so the way to answer this question, I'm going to put it in a box. So the way, the way we answer this question is we basically have three times, uh, we'll do a C dot. Okay, so what is the three representing here? It's three of what? Seven to the power of two. Very good. Okay, so that's very good. Seven to the power of two plus... What about the two? We have two of seven to the power of one. Then finally, we have six times oops, seven to the power of zero in this case. So it becomes, I'm just doing my mental math here. Okay, so three times 49 plus two times seven plus Six oops, times ah, one, and that becomes one hundred and forty-seven. One hundred forty-seven plus fourteen plus six, which is um, twenty plus one forty-seven, which is one hundred and sixty-seven in base ten. Is that okay? So that's why you know a calculator can be helpful here. You can bring a calculator as a result. But any calculator would work fine. You know, in this case, uh, you can go to the Dollar Tree and actually just spend a dollar on a calculator. Even those would work fine here. All right, second part. Uh, figure out the related definitions. This part needs to be correct for the following part to be scored. All right, because you know, without knowing these, we cannot actually find the result. Okay. 
So what is R of U, W um, in base 7 in the subtract? Is it a subtraction? I think it's a subtraction. Yeah. Yep, it is a subtraction. Because whether it's a subtraction or addition actually matters in this case. Okay, because it's minus base 2. So can somebody tell me how R of U, W? Those are just names, okay? Because sometimes we use U and V, sometimes we use U and W, but they're just names. <clears throat> so what is it going to look like for base 7? It's the single digit difference. Go ahead. It's 7 plus U mm -hmm. minus W minus Yep, 7 plus U minus W, and then the whole thing mod the base, which is 7. Yep, that's right. All right, next one is the borrow function. The borrow function is one of the easiest because we just have to say if u is less than w, then we return a 1, otherwise we return a 0. Okay. And how is q of i defined in this case? So q of i is, I mean, you know, it's the r of xi by i. How about D? I mean, all of this you know, should be relatively familiar by now. Um, D of I is the R of um, QITI. And then I of uh, T of I plus 1. T of I plus 1 is the D of XI YI. Or you can use a plus here if you want to. That works too. Um, D of Q I T I. There we go. All right. Are we good with this stuff? In other words, this portion, the entire um, portion here for part two, they are really just asking you to regurgitate what is already in the notes. Okay in preparation for the actual application. So number three is to copy the multi-digit subtraction, and we need to figure out every single bit or every single digit. So I'm going to go back here, OK? And we'll try to figure this out, OK? So what goes into the blinky cursor position, or what goes into this position here? How do we figure that out? We know something plus 6 has a single, excuse me, minus, something minus 6 has a single digit difference of 4 in this case. Okay? So we write down the equation, okay? So this part I'm just going to write on the whiteboard here. So we know something minus 6 gets a single digit of 4. But instead of looking at it this, looking at it this way, we know there are of some unknown as 6, which 4. But we know what r is, right? So r is 7 plus unknown minus 6, the whole thing, mod 7, which is a 4. So how do we resolve you know, this question mark here? Well, the first attempt, OK, is to say, um, if this is 4 over here, we need something minus 6 being 4. So we, we can now say this whole thing can be a 10. Does that work? 10 minus 6 is 4. 4 mod 7 is a 4. Okay. But in order for this entire thing to be a 10, what do you think question mark needs to be? It's a 3. That's right. Okay. So that means we can resolve this. Oh, okay. You can use whatever means that makes sense to you. But it has to be based on how the R function is defined, or at least based on the concept of, of a single digit subtraction. Yep. So now that we know we have a 3 minus 6, we can also fill this one as a 1, because 3 is less than 6. So that means that subtraction is going to need a borrow. All right, next one is, oh, this one is easy. What minus 2 has a 0? has to be 2 itself, right? 
so that one is super duper easy. We just put the two here. Um, two minus two is a zero. Zero minus one is gonna have a ball of one, and this is gonna be a what? Okay, let me point up here. Uh, okay, this is, let's work on this one first. This is an easy one. What is the single digit difference of four minus zero? Not zero. Four. It's four. Yep, it's just four. So we'll figure that one out first. This is just four. How about this one here? We have zero minus one. Remember, we are working with base seven. What is zero minus one in base seven? No. This is why we have the R function mentioned. That is correct. It is six. Okay. Because, oh, okay. That's the wrong part here. <clears throat> this is six because we basically we have seven plus zero, which is seven. Seven minus six is a one. One mod seven. No, take it back. Minus one. Okay. This is a zero. This is a one. We are looking at R of 0, 1, so that is 7 plus 0 minus 1, the whole thing is not 7, and that turns out to be 6. Okay, very good. Um, let's work out the rest, okay? So what minus 3 is 3 in base 7? Uh, 6 itself, yep, 6 is the correct answer, all right? So 6 minus 3 is a 3, because 6 is the last digit we can represent in base 7. So now we have 3 minus 1, which is still a 2 with no borrow in either 1. Put a 0 there. Is that OK? All right. So to get this part done, especially if you want to get it done quickly, you need to you know, have the R function and the B function basically memorized and have applied that multiple times, so that way you know, it just gets faster as you try to work this out. All right, so now the question is asking if we are to interpret row X, T, and V individually, what, is, what are the values? All right, so let's take a look. I'm just gonna put the answer here, okay? So this would be six times 49 plus two times 14 plus three times one, which is <laughs> uh, 300 minus 6 is 294 plus 28 plus 3. And, sorry? Say again? Yeah, we have 6 times 49. Yeah. Uh, two times seven, two times oh, two times seven. You're correct. Yep. Yep. You are correct. All right. So that would be three hundred and eight plus one, which is three hundred eleven in base ten. Um, do you want me to work out the other two rows too, or, or do you guys kind of get a general idea? You get a general idea. Okay. All right. So that's. Almost it, except for there's one more. What is the decimal representation of the B? Oh, okay, so this part does not even need the value. So we only need the D row for the value. Okay, so I, it's not wrong, it's just unnecessary. So we just need to work with this one. Two times 49 plus six times seven plus four times one. And that would be 98 plus 42 plus 4, that's uh, 140 plus 4, which is 144. I mean, if you get the math wrong, you know, but you get the format right, if you get this part, and then somehow mess up this part over here, it's hard to do most of it. All right. So moving on, shall we? Okay, so this is number three from exam two of uh, spring 2024 because 
I move some of the topics out of the way. So normally I put this part, put this in exam two, but because we skipped a few topics for this semester, so this becomes your part of exam one. All right. So let me first explain what you know these what all of these things are. This part here is just to save you the trouble of having to look it up. <laughs> it's exactly the same as in the notes, okay? Which is the only thing you really need to figure out the entire answer. But we will go ahead and try to answer the individual part. So no, number one is exp is to express the bit pattern of D in binary, and D is this in hexadecimal. You can use the dot dot zero dot dot notation with an indication of the number of zeros. Okay, so let's work on this one. So we'll go ahead and um, I'll replace one of the ER line breaks with the actual answer here. All right, so um, we have four, which is zero one zero zero. Zero is zero 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 zero. Uh, six is zero one one zero. C is one one zero zero. 9 is 1001, and then we just have a bunch of zeros here all the way to the end. So I'll use parentheses to indicate the number of zeros. So can somebody tell me how many zeros do we need over here? All of these digits of the pattern is 64. 4, 8, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 of the 64 bits. So how many zeros do we have? 44, okay. So we just say 44 zeros, okay. Are we good so far? All right. All right, so the next part is asking what is the position of the sign bit? Your answer should look like D subscript of something, okay, but obviously 20 is the wrong answer in terms of format. Is the value being represented negative or non-negative? So there are two parts to this particular question. So first of all, you have to tell me which one is telling me the sign of the entire thing, and what is the bit position again? You don't even need to study. Everything is up here. 64, 63, okay? Bit 63 is the, is the sign bit. Okay, I take it back. You do need to study <laughs> because if you don't study and only rely on what is in the question, it will take you much longer to answer you know, all the questions. So studying helps to make it faster, okay? So the answer is um, D63, subscript 63 is the sign bit. And in this case, because the sign bit is a zero, the value is non-negative. There we go. So this is the answer to part two. All right, so part three is asking, what is the range of bits corresponding to the biased exponent? Okay, so your answer should look like this equals to the exact you know, bit pattern. All right, so can someone tell me you know, from which bit to which bit are the biased exponents? So once again, you don't have to study, and once again, you do have to study, but the answer is already here. So of the equation, the gigantic equation here, which part do you think is the cortical biased exponent? Hmm? Okay. Yeah, starting with bit 52, okay? So this portion, okay, is the biased exponent, specifically this part. Is the biased exponent. And that's why we have to subtract 1,023, because 1,023 is the actual amount of bias. So the first part of the question is simply asking from where to where? Oh, look at this. Bit 52 to bit 62. Oh, okay. So that makes it easy to answer this question. So we just have to say, uh, using the format that's already suggested, we basically go from high to low. So that's bit 62 down to bit uh, 52. And in this case, we have one followed by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, one, zero, and base two. 
because what we are looking at is, oh, okay, that's not what I intended. This is bit 62 and all the way down to bit 52. That's bit 52, this zero here is bit 52. So that's the answer. Are we good, doing okay so far? Extracting which part is the biased exponent? It's basically what this portion is. I mean, this the, those individual bits allow us to, to compute this sigma notation. Once we have the result of the sigma notation, we subtract 1,023 from it. That becomes the actual exponent of two. Don't ask me why it is like this, because the IEEE decided this is how we're gonna use the bits. <laughs> Yes, so it's a, it's a question for the IEEE in that case. Okay, so step by step, compute the value of the unbiased exponent of two, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so let's go figure that out. All right, so we'll do this. And we want the unmix, unbiased, right? So that means we are looking at uh, a two plus a four plus a 1024, because that's what the binary number is representing. So that would be, oh, we have to subtract 1,023 because the bias amount. So now we have what? One, 1030, right? 1030 minus 1,023, which is a seven. Are we good so far? So you guys may not be able to do this as quickly as I do because, you know, because I already know this is you know, two, this is a four, and I count that this is a 1,024. So you guys, it might take you a little longer, but that's kind of the answer that I'm expecting, is you can tell me you know, how do you get to this value. And I need to see that the bias is a part of the calculation. Okay. All right, so number 10, I mean, question number five, part number five of this question. How is the mantissa of D represented in this bit pattern? Uh, show how bits of D are utilized and express the mantissa of D as a base two number. Okay, so let's do that. All right. I'm gonna take out one of the line breaks, okay? All right, so the fraction part of the mantissa is from bit 51 to bit 0. So that means the mantissa in this case, and I have to actually look at the bit you know, from before. So in this case, it would be um, from here all the way down. So we have 1100100. One, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. Those are all to the right-hand side of the point. So it's one point, and then we have one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, and then a bunch of zeros after that. All right, so let me go back here so we can see the answer. That's the answer, where the mouse cursor is. So the Matisse is one point, one, one, zero, zero, okay, because they are about the that's, this is bit 51, 50 and so on, and then we just have a bunch of zeros after that, so I just put dot 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 here to make it all numbers. And the, I might want to emphasize this is a base two number, okay, there we go. And that answers this entire question because it just wants to know the mantissa as a base two number, and this is definitely a base two number as the mantissa. All right, on to the next part. So the next part is Step by step, compute and express the mantissa of D as a mixed fraction in base 10. All right, so let's work on this one. This one is gonna look a little bit ugly. So I'm going to, all right. So we'll do this you know, step by step. Mm. Um, let me see if I can. I'm 
try to do a multi-line thing. But if it doesn't let me do that, that's fine. I can do something else. All right. Let me think about how to do this. Okay, I can do this. All right. So we are looking at one point, one one zero zero one zero zero one, in base two. That is one plus. Um, 1 divided by 2 plus 1 divided by 4, and now I have to count 2. Because this is the 1 divided by 2, this is the 1 divided by 4, so now the count, this is 8, 16, 32, this is the 64. Okay. So plus 1 divided by 64, and then this one is 128. Did I do the math wrong? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's 27, 8, 9. Okay. Was it 9? Wrong. It is 9. So this is a 1 divided by 512. But this is not a mixed fraction the way it is specified here. So I want to kind of turn it into a mixed fraction. So that becomes 1 plus some blah, blah, blah divided by 512. So since I'm using a common denominator of 512, one half is going to be a 256, one quarter is going to be a 128, one sixty fourth is going to be, I think, an eight, and then plus the one, okay? And then we can now have the actual fraction. So we just have, this is one followed by a fraction where the denominator is 512, and the numerator, so if you have a calculator, it's easier, but if you have a calculator, you can just end it up. Uh, these two added together is 384, so 391, 393. So we have 393 as the numerator. Is that okay? All right, <clears throat> and then for the, uh, is that the last part? Yep, it is the last part here. Okay. So the last part is to figure out the actual value. All right, so the actual value is the sign, okay, so V is the sign, which is a one, okay, that's the easy part, and the mantissa, and we know the mantissa is um, is one and then the mixed fraction. So I'm just doing this step by step. And the mixed fraction has 393 as the numerator, 512 as the denominator. And then don't forget you know, the, the power of two. And we figured the unbiased uh, exponent was what, seven? up here. So now we just have to do the actual calculation. So that becomes, uh, what? I'm just going to do this step by step. 2 to the power of 7 is 128 plus um, fraction is, I'm doing my simplification you know, by hand. If you have a calculator, you can do it much faster. So we have um, 2 to the power of 7 is 128. So that means we have a 4 here. So now it becomes 128 plus, OK, mental math. <laughs> uh, three, 393 divided by 4 is, let's see, is it a 9? Yep, it's a 9 followed by a fraction. So nine times four, oh, it's 90, sorry, 90. 90 and a quarter. 90 something, 90 what? 98. 98 with a remainder of? One. There we go. And then finally, we just kind of add all these components together. We have 200 and This is 
six, two and then twenty six, right? Two two six and a quarter. Okay. You guys can check my math. But the process is the important part. Is that okay? No. Wow. Right on time too. <laughs> I didn't plan. All right. So how do you study for this test? Hmm? So what you can do is to make sure that you understand all the concepts. So you know, making sure that you know the knowledge part, which is all the definitions, is super important. And we already know that your exam is not going to look like this. Okay, you know, not at least entirely look like this. So that means you know, you should not be focusing on repeating the very same steps over and over again. That is not going to be very productive. What you do need to know is, okay, so we know that the test is going to uh, test my knowledge of a double, okay? So you, so instead of repeating all of these steps, the question that you need to answer is, do I know which bit of a 64-bit double is doing which part in order to figure out the value, okay? So you might want to go through this like a few times, okay? You know, um, you can you know, probably work with a few different numbers. So instead of working forward like this, you can also work backwards. In other words, you start off with a value that you want to represent, and you go backwards to figure out what is the bit representation of that thing. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Um, and then for the earlier questions, like these ones, okay, um, this one has to do with um, you know base seven subtraction. So you may not want to repeat the same process over and over again because you can basically overstudy. The real question to ask is, what is the R function doing in an addition? What is the R function doing in a subtraction? How do I define the C function for addition? How do I define the D function in the subtraction? Okay. Uh, what if I change the base to five? What if I change the base to nine and so on? Do I know how to figure those things out? Okay. And then for the previous question, this one, it is about signed versus unsigned representation. Okay, so we have to read up on signed versus unsigned representation. Um, I think the key concepts are the BS versus the VU functions. Okay, because that actually tells you how to interpret the bits. Uh, for signed interpretation, you know, we have to know if I know this is the value that I want to negate arithmetically. How can I do this using a bit operation, which is the two's complement? Okay, so you can practice the, the two's complement. Um, and then given a certain number of bits, okay, what is the range of values that can be represented in both signed and also unsigned? Okay, all of those we have already covered in the class. And then question number one is, you know, I mean, this one is, it involves understanding you know the actual relationship between all the bits okay so you have to remember how the q are defined using x and y how the e is defined using q and t how the t of i plus one is defined using x i y i q i t i for subtraction so what about for addition you have to remember the addition is a little different because instead of a borrow we have a carry how is that different okay so those are the things that you need to kind of make sure that you understand, okay? So mix and match things, you know, to make sure that you fully understand all the concepts. The format may look similar to what we are seeing here, but I can guarantee the questions will not be the same. We good so far? All right. So I can give you guys a choice because we are at 1030 right now. We can do a lab, which is based on the value propagation thing that we talked about in the previous class, because we do have time to do it, and that topic is already covered. If we do it today, it means you know, it's easier for you guys to remember all that stuff, because I won't see you for another, wait, today is Tuesday. So I'll see you on Thursday, so that should be fine. So we can do the lab today, or we can do it on Thursday, so that you guys can use the rest of this time possibly to 
ask me questions about you know, all of these things that we covered today. So it's your choice. Do you want to do the lab or do you want to end the class early so that I can have an extended office hour starting from 10.30? <laughs> so many decisions that I have to make. No professor would give me this many decisions to make with so many degrees of freedom. So I think the consensus seems like you know, no lab for today. Yes, okay. So is anyone dying to have a lab today? You know, because I just need, need to exercise my mind a little bit more. Yeah, okay. So we'll just kind of postpone the lab to to Thursday, this Thursday, but I'm gonna stay here, okay? So if anyone has any questions about the four questions that I just answered, or any concepts related to the four questions, I can try to answer those questions. But for people who came a little bit late, okay, you, know, you might want to kind of watch the video a little bit first. I'll stay here, okay, I'll stay here, so that you guys can have time to watch the video a little bit, and then you'll come ask me questions after watching at least the earlier part of the video. All right, so I am going to stop the recording.